Hi, this is Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, broadcasting from the Dezine studio in London. Today is Earth Day, and we're launching a collaboration with Cultural Foundation VAC around the non, non-extractive architecture initiative. This calls for a new type of architecture which does not exploit the planet or indeed uh, the people of the planet. And joining me to discuss it and explain what non-extractive architecture is, is Joseph Grima, who's calling in from Milan. Joseph is co-founder of research studio Space Caviar and is the brains behind the non-extractive architecture projects. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Marcus. Hi. So first of all, Joseph, where are you today? You're, you're not in Venice. This is a project that's, that sort of runs parallel to the Venice Architecture Biennale, but you're, you're in Milan, right? I'm actually uh, in Milan today. So yeah, back, back and forth between Venice and Milan these days. And just give, it a, give us a bit of context. Who are you and what is Space Caviar? Uh, yeah, as you, uh, as you mentioned, um, Space Caviar is a, a, a design and research and architecture studio um, based uh, between Milan and London. And we uh, essentially try to look at architecture as a full spectrum activity, what we, we call full spectrum in the sense of trying to uh, push the boundaries uh, beyond the very kind of strictly defined limits of what constitutes design in the, the kind of accepted sense. Uh, and try to kind of go a little bit beyond that and to try to consider the broader implications of what it means to build and therefore also whether it's uh, a good idea to build and, uh, and and more broadly like what are the implications both cultural and economic and political and so on of the activities that fall under the kind of umbrella of what we call architecture. And uh, as part of your work at Space Caviar, you've come up with this concept of non-extractive architecture. Um, first of all, tell us what is non-extractive architecture? What does it mean? Uh, yeah, non-extractive architecture is in a way the culmination of um, a number of years of reflection on the um, broader implications of architecture as an activity, trying to, again, kind of look beyond the boundaries, um, the kind of strictly um, uh, disciplinary boundaries. In particular, um, non-extractive architecture looks at the idea of an architecture that doesn't produce externalities. Uh, now, that may require us to go a little, we can drill a little bit deeper into what that means, but basically, uh, um, the kind of starting point of this project is looking at um, the unseen consequences of architecture, both in terms of building, in terms of labor, in terms of communities, in terms of materials, in terms of um, decommissioning of buildings as well. A lot of things that are very rarely discussed within the kind of uh, traditional discourse of architecture but that nevertheless uh, interlock, as you were saying, today is Earth Day. And I think the question of our sort of stewardship of the planet is very much on everybody's mind in every um, branch of human activity. And as we know, the construction industry, the architecture industry, does uh, is estimated to account for close to 40 percent of co2 emissions co2 is one part of the problem it's not the whole problem but uh, we if we're going to do something about that it can't be simply making buildings more efficient we really need to look at every angle of what we build why we build question why we build it whether it needs to be built in the first place and looking all the way back to where the material that's going into it is coming from and what's going to happen to it in the long term. So it's attempting to broaden the discourse, really. And When you said at the beginning of that answer that um, non-extractive architecture tries to avoid externalities, by externalities you mean damage, right? Or damage that's done somewhere away from the actual building itself. Yeah, I mean, externality is a, uh, a, a, it's a term we borrowed, borrowed from the field of economics. Um, externality is essentially a, a, a hidden cost. It can actually, technically, it can also be a benefit, but it's, it's a cost or benefit that affects a third party, somebody who is not involved in uh, the, the, the task at hand. So, um, I mean, the, the simplest kind of um, example, possibly the most used example of that is, uh, get into my car, I drive um, to do my shopping, I'm essentially pumping a certain amount of gases into the atmosphere. And those, that obviously damages me because then I breathe those gases, uh, but it damages everybody else as well. Whether or not they agree with the idea that I do my shopping, it's they're paying whether, whether or not they use a car themselves, they're also essentially paying a portion of that. And, and it's pollution is a kind of an easy um, example. It's an easy way of illustrating it, but it's also, touches all sorts of other um, aspects of um, our industry. For example, um, 
certain uh, kind of very uh, ambitious and uh, 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 large scale um, construction projects that perhaps require labor to be imported from somewhere else in, other, in order for them to be economically viable. Of course, that has consequences. It, it solves a problem for me because I can get my building uh, built on budget, but it essentially deprives the community somewhere else beyond the horizon of uh, a portion of its own community, of its own workforce, of its own, um, of a, that deprives a lot of people, of fa breaks families. So it's thinking about what are the consequences, what is the price, not just in terms of a kind of a spreadsheet of a budget, but the bigger picture in, in, in many different terms, also kind of human and um, environmental as well as economic. And taking the analogy of driving your car to the shops, there are the externalities that are caused by that journey, but there's also the hidden externalities of where the car was made in the first place, the, the materials that went into making the car, the labor conditions, the transporting of the car to the local dealership, and then also what happens to the car after you've drove it um, the clock round a few times. Does it get taken apart and reused? Does it get put in landfill and those kind of... Um, the pre-externalities and the post-externalities of your ownership of that vehicle. Absolutely. And in a way, um, a lot of what um, <clears throat> led us to initiate this project was also a certain frustration around the word sustainability. Um, the idea that simply by making your building out of a certain material or making it particularly performative in terms of energy use, you've somehow solved the problem. Um, and the attempt in fact is to, in a way, kind of uh, describe the problem as much bigger than we would like to see it. And it's not simply about making our buildings energy efficient, that's absolutely necessary. And in a way it should be taken for granted. But the point is, again, uh, a quick example, um, of those 40% of um, total emissions that can be somehow uh, traced back to the construction industry, a significant amount, probably close to half, um, somewhere around half, actually comes from, or maybe it's not quite as much half, I don't have the data on, uh, to hand, but a significant amount of that is actually simply um, CO2 that's released during the process of uh, allowing co concrete to cure, uh, which is something that I don't think is particularly widely known, that this miracle material that over the last hundred years we've come to rely on um, is actually one of the primary sources of CO2 emissions because as it sets it lets off CO2. So this is something that we uh, often simply don't factor into um, the equation that the, the, the whole sort of in implications of the way that we do things the way we do. So the yes yeah, so it, it, it's really kind of trying to transcend this question of being some kind of simply efficient and to look at all of the implications stage by stage in order to be able to revisit. And of course, the kind of conclusion that you quickly arrive at is that we really need to rethink the practice of architecture to be something that is much more sort of in, in, integrated with, the, uh, it's with its immediate, immediate surroundings and to be less dependent on things that are happening a long way away. So long, complex supply chains, for example. And um, so non-extractive architecture is a, a concept, it's a, a manifesto, and you've also done a book and you've got a, a long ongoing exhibition, a research project in Venice. Tell us a little bit about the components of the project and also about VAC, which is the foundation that you're doing this in collaboration with. Yeah, I mean, I, I could, um, I have a few slides that I could uh, share with you, if you like, um, just to kind of illustrate that a bit is now a good moment or? Uh, Perfect, quick yeah. Overview. Okay. Perfect. Let's see if I can... Um... That sounded like we planned it. <laughs> yeah, it just so happens. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. You may, you may be able to see my screen now. Yep. Um, so this is just kind of uh, the general overview of um, uh, the project. So those are the dates. As you said, it's a, it's a long project from started on the 15th of March with a hiccup here and there. As you know, Italy was in lockdown at the time. Um, but it'll be running on until the beginning of next year. Um, and the, um, uh, so yeah, here uh, on the left, you can see um, VAC Zattere, which is the Italian headquarters, the Venetian headquarters um, in, of uh, VAC Foundation, which is um, based in Moscow. And VAC is um, uh, a, contempor a, a foundation for uh, the arts, um, which occasionally also engages with um, uh, themes around architecture, especially in 
uh, moment um, in, 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 as you pointed out at the beginning, in parallel to the Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, and uh, these are my colleagues of Space Caviar, um, Sofia Pia Belenki and Camilo Oliveira, who are uh, working on the project with me. Uh, but in fact, there's a much broader network of people who um, I'll say a little bit more um, about, who also kind of are part of this project. Um, and I say project rather than exhibition, because even though VAC Zatter is beautiful, Palazzo so that you can see on the left is um, an exhibition space. It's typically used as an exhibition space and also for public programs and so on. We really wanted to make this project as multidimensional as possible in terms of the um, kind of languages and the narratives that we present. So uh, it's absolutely, um, as you pointed out, um, an exhibition, but there's also a significant part of public program that will be running in uh, parallel, both on um, uh, uh, online via Zoom, but also um, in uh, throughout the Palazzo. There's also a residency program attached to this because we're very interested in involving uh, people from many different fields. Um, so as well as architects and designers, also material scientists, also um, economists, um, specialists in uh, 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 vernacular architecture specialists in um, uh, high-tech uh, manufacturing processes and so on. So throughout the course of the year, the Palazzo will really be a kind of a hub of activity. Um, and this is a photograph of Armin Linker, which um, is actually on the cover of the book. I'll show you in a few seconds, but it's a it's a, 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 a shot of the Barcelona Pavilion. It will resonate with many as kind of one of Mises um, kind of masterpieces. Uh, and in a way, the um, kind of this piece, which I think all of us uh, and all of those of us who studied architecture um, have kind of considered, have been um, really kind of uh, held up as a symbol of um, a certain amount of idea of architecture is also in a way the starting point of this project, this stone that um, is so kind of um, incredibly evocative in the space and has uh, the kind of almost the value of a, a work of art um, inside the pavilion. Uh, very little is thought or said, and, and that, of course, kind of a, a project that was kind of incredibly um, influential on uh, in the history of modernism. Um, and we're interested not so much in the kind of compositional dimension of this project or of this image, but in the uh, almost kind of in the in the narrative dimension uh, that uh, underpins an architecture of this kind. Like where did that stone actually come from? What is uh, the history of its extraction? What um, will uh, be there now that it is no longer there? What were the kind of um, uh, consequences of it ending up in um, in this uh, architectural masterpiece? So kind of looking at the in invisible, uh, you could describe it almost as side effects of uh, the production of a masterpiece. Um, and so in a way, the kind of this, this is one of the key, some of the key questions that we're looking at if uh, instead of a, 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 an idea of architecture that is really sort of driven by um, a compositional uh, vocation, um, if in, uh, instead if it was more um, a form of stewardship, I think uh, husbandry maybe isn't the right word, um, the, the idea of stewardship of the natural environment. Um, and what if uh, we could also consider the whole sort of economic um, dimension to be part of the uh, design process if it were much more tightly integrated rather than us just kind of looking at the spreadsheet how if how about if we can work closer with um, those who design the sort of um, mechanisms through which society uh, moves forward and, and what if we also became more interested in the question of su supply chains and tried to kind of decomplexify a little bit Obviously, um, the the highly integrated um, uh, uh, networks of um, global um, globalized modernity have been incredibly beneficial to architecture. Many things are possible now that would never have uh, previously been possible, but that also has consequences. It also has a price, and we're interested in. Um, in thinking about what could be done, what if we actually kind of gave up some of that choice or that uh, diversity in favor of making something that's more closely integrated with its immediate surroundings. And, and so uh, it kind of, in a way, sort of goes back to the question of um, oil, that uh, the, the, the idea of 
uh, a lot of sort of hydrocarbons and uh, whether we should actually be taking them out of the soil or whether should, we should be leaving them underground and looking for other ways, other ways of production that don't involve extraction of resources that are non-replaceable. And this is a, a quick sketch that um, my friend Dan Hill did um, that when we, we were talking about the project and he was saying, oh, that's, uh, that's amusing because in fact, Venice is uh, a city um, that's actually um, a city of stone that was extracted obviously from underground built on trees that existed above ground. So it's kind of almost upside down. What was above ground went underwater because as you know, Venice was built on piles um, of, of wood driven into the Laguna. Um, and what if we imagine this almost like it, Venice in a way is a, a very appropriate place to be asking these questions because what we really need to do is turn Venice upside down like leave the rock underground and perhaps uh, work more red, more frequently with trees and with other replaceable, uh, renewable elements that um, exist above ground. Uh, and so this is um, the first output of the project is this book, um, Non-Extractive Architecture on De Designing Without Depletion, Volume 1. And I think that this, um, this subtitle, Designing Without Depletion, is also quite a good definition of uh, non-extractive architecture. How can we question the, how, how can we kind of, uh, it, it, we should maybe more frequently ask ourselves this question, like what is, is my work, is my output actually producing somewhere or for somebody, some form of depletion? And is there an alternative to that? Um, this book um, contains contributions from, in a way, as you pointed out, um, it is a manifesto. And I think that non-extractive architecture is not um, built starting from zero. We're not saying anything that hasn't been said before, but what we're trying to do is to systematize or to kind of connect a number of people who are bringing quite a diverse range of perspectives, not all of which agree with each other uh, onto this topic. So we're kind of trying to tap into a, um, and to organize a, a trans, a, a, a quite a, a cross section of uh, groups, individuals, people from many different backgrounds, including, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a, a good example of somebody who may not typically be part of a project like this is Emanuele Kocha, who's actually a philosopher whose work deals primarily with the kind of idea of a non-anthropocentric um, philosophy um, through to um, more uh, familiar names in our field like Kelly Stilling and Mark Wigley. And then through also to a new generation of um, thinkers and designers who are really attempting to put into practice a lot of this work like uh, Luke Jones from Heat Island who's based in London and um, uh, Charlotte uh, Malte-Barth who's um, uh, doing some really brilliant work on the question of um, a, a moratorium on building um, through to Elise Turbe, who's um, done some of the most important writing in recent years, Elsa Hoover, who's uh, working really on also the kind of uh, indigenous legacy of uh, design in the US, um, and so on. This is a drawing by Charlotte, uh, kind of really um, uh, uh, inspired by a, a, a famous drawing of Morphosis, but that looks in an absolutely amazing way, um, in our opinion, at all of the elements that go into the, con con the constitute a building um, and kind of exploding those and asking questions about each of them. Where do they come from? What are they, uh, what do, they um, do? And, or Luke Jones um, uh, looking at the question of carbon flows um, between a forest, the place of origin of materials and the building. Uh, so again, this idea of flows um, and of a kind of broader understanding of, um, uh, of what it is to, uh, what architecture is and what it is to be a designer. Um, and it involves, uh, the, the project is, exists on many different dimensions. Uh, primary, everything is driven by research, but it also includes um, a residency program uh, in which we're very fortunate to be able to bring to Venice 10 residents throughout the course of the year to help us uh, kind of get, bring additional perspectives to our own um, onto this topic, uh, but also public programs, publishing, broadcasting. So really the production of discourse through many different, um, in many different forms. Uh, and the, the idea of this, it, it's, a, it's an unusual exhibition in the sense that um, it's very much a laboratory. We're not interested in producing a formalistic output in which it's images on the walls or uh, videos or objects in space. We're interested in bringing the building alive with people who are uh, thinking and talking about themes that they consider urgent. Um, so in that sense, 
Um, for example, one of the ways in which we're doing that is not just through kind of research and writing and public programs, but also through a materials workshop that we've um, set up on the ground floor that includes actually the equipment that's needed to produce prototypes and to look at uh, the different forms of materials. We've also, um, again, again, going back to this very unusual format of exhibition, um, exhibition making, uh, of course, it would be rather incongruous if on the topic of this kind, we were taking a strategy of shipping a lot of stuff around the world and producing a very elaborate display system. Uh, so we actually wanted to kind of really go back to the very basics, the essential of what it means to make an exhibition um, in the most kind of frugal, materially frugal terms possible. Um, and uh, together with um, the group um, F451, uh, um, uh, Domitil de Bray and Quentin Cruzet, uh, they uh, developed a, um, a, a very kind of um, simple interface that allows us to actually tile all of our content onto uh, simple monochrome A3 pages that are then uh, going to gradually colonize the whole of the building. So one of the unusual things about this exhibition is that on opening day back in March, the building was empty. And throughout the course of the year until January of next year, it's gradually going to accumulate with evidence, with samples, material samples, with content of all sorts of different kinds. Um, and so the, the, build, the exhibition currently in, in its current form is actually equipment, it's tools that we use to uh, produce this, um, the content that's uh, being elaborated by the residents throughout the course of the public program and gradually uh, using the building almost like a, a notebook in which we collate and co uh, collect this discourse and actually kind of spread it um, around the walls so that visitors actually almost kind of go into our, um, it can, can, can see the research happening live in real time. And an important part of this is, again, uh, other forms of tools, um, a broadcast station designed by N55, um, a studio based in Germany and in Denmark, uh, which is uh, uh, essentially a, a mobile device for um, capturing and broadcasting um, all of the events that happen inside the space, um, a mobile library that collects the kind of, uh, in a way, the, the more sort of discourse based, the kind of academic um, uh, side of the research and a um, publishing station that also produces uh, a kind of output in the form of um, printed matter that can then almost like the, the, the equivalent of kind of a catalog that's happening in real time in public space. Um, and they're all in the form of vehicles, as you probably notice, which is kind of unusual, obviously. But what we um, really like about this is that it's almost a little bit like when uh, NASA made the Voyager um, uh, capsules that were then sent off into, into space as a form of sort of uh, uh, way of um, sending a message into deep space. All of these uh, tool, all of these vehicles and uh, instruments that I described will continue to travel after uh, we don't see the project. Something like non-extractive architecture is um, an ongoing discourse that we expect to develop over um, the coming years. So, the fact that these are vehicles is also um, a way of uh, kind of hinting at and, 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 and signifying the idea that, in fact, they will then go out into the world and somehow continue to collect. Uh, almost like the space probe idea, um, uh, a little bit like um, Ingenuity on Mars, uh, collecting and continuing to um, compile this information. So that's a quick snapshot, and obviously the kind of uh, what we're the the, the 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 reason that this book that um, just came out, um, non-extractive architecture on design without depletion, is called Volume One because uh, this book, in a way, is like um, a theoretical basis on which all of our work will develop throughout the course of the year. The work will be much more material focused, will be much more hands-on. Uh, and all of that kind of research, which will document a network, an international network of people who are um, thinking about these themes, working on these themes, uh, will be compiled into volume two, which will become a handbook of sorts in the hope that um, we, we, we absolutely claim no sort of ownership over the idea of non-extractive architecture. We hope that it'll be taken and interpreted the way that anybody wishes to interpret it. So, okay, that's, um, that's a quick uh, uh, bird's eye view. I hope that's... So what can we expect to see in volume two of non-extractive architecture then? Will it be examples of how people can achieve non-extractive architecture? Will it be like a, a tool book or what will it be? Uh, it'll absolutely, I, I think that um, we, 
are very clear about the fact that we don't want to be kind of gatekeepers of this concept. We don't want to say this is what is non-extractive architecture and this is not. It's a very individual matter. It's something that's up to every single uh, designer. But there are a lot of people, as I was saying, there are a lot of people who are thinking about these things, not just on a theoretical level, but also in terms of uh, very kind of concrete terms about what is, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, um, what is uh, it actually means to build in a way that, uh, for example, doesn't sort of depend on um, uh, concrete as a material that, and, and all of the sort of emission consequences that I described earlier. So um, one thing that's, um, we're working with uh, a, a very broad network. We're continuing to collect uh, case studies of people who are looking at uh, ways of building that are essential we could describe as non-extractive, which range from um, explorations of the possibilities of uh, earth as a material um, formed through 3D printing, for example. So that's kind of really kind of uh, very kind of future oriented, technology driven, um, all the way through to the kind of um, re-evaluation of vernacular architecture and certain kind of natural ventilation systems. Um, all uh, in, on top of that, um, things like uh, the um, shift that's occurring now throughout much of Europe, and in fact, much of the world towards mass timber uh, and prefabrication offsite production, um, the uh, embodiment of carbon through um, uh, carefully kind of carbon accountability, so also the kind of economic uh, uh, side effects. There's many people who are working on many different parts of this. and. Our feeling is like we um, ourselves uh, only know a little portion of it, and we want to kind of spread the word, get as much of it into this book as possible in order for it to be almost like a kind of a cheat sheet that you can look through and either find people who have knowledge that maybe is helpful to you as a designer or that you can borrow from and, uh, and emulate their techniques in order to achieve this uh, goal of um, non-extractivity, in other words. And you mentioned just now a vernacular architecture. It, it, does this in a way uh, hint at maybe a new type of vernacular? Like, for example, where I grew up in Hampshire in the south of England, all the, all the houses were made of chalk because that's what you dug down beneath the few inches of soil and you hit chalk. And then somewhere else it would be brick because it was based on clay and somewhere else it would be wood because there was no usable material beneath the, the subsoil and somewhere else it would be stone because they were on on stone, uh, is is that the kind of um, thing that we could end up with following the, the logic of non-extractive architecture? You have to take stuff from somewhere, but I guess you're saying it take it from um, as close as possible to where you are and with with minimum damage to the place you take it from. Yeah, I guess one way of kind of looking at that is the if you're, uh, for example, quarrying to make concrete. Uh, to, you need sand, you need chalk, you need um, lime, you need the various kind of components of that. If that quarry is on the other side of the world, uh, or if the sand's coming from the bottom of a river on the other side of the world and it's eroding the banks of the river and that river is causing, that, that's in turn is causing flooding and so on. If that's happening somewhere in, um, that's physically distant from you, you're, the, the more distant is, the less likely you're going to care because it's going to have very little direct consequence on you. It becomes, as we were saying, an externality, something that affects essentially somebody else. It imposes a cost on somebody else. As soon as that's brought back to you, you suddenly say, well, there's a trade-off because on the one hand, concrete's an amazing material. It's really fantastic. I can make it into more or less any shape I like. It um, sets quickly, it's super strong. On the other hand, it means that I have to dig a massive quarry in my backyard, which is going to ruin the view. And then it, you, you really start to think twice about it. So things like, um, I don't know, for example, mass timber or uh, CLT or so on become a little bit more attractive because all you have to do is grow trees and trees are obviously much less. So by bringing things closer, you automatically, in a way, invite uh, communities to factor into their own sort of lives, their own existence, what are the consequences of building in a certain way. So bring things home is one part of, uh, it, it's a very important part of the strategy. We think that by reducing the scale, reducing the length of supply chains, you're not only kind of, I mean, it's the kind of the obvious one, uh, reducing a lot of all the emissions that are related to transportation and so on, but more interestingly than that, you're making evident what are the consequences of what you do um, to a certain extent. Um, and so vernacular in that sense, yeah, you could describe, vernacular is a little bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, there's an incredible, amazing amount of 
incredible things that have been done by under the sort of rubric of uh, vernacular architecture and Bernard Rudovsky's exhibition, Architecture Without Architects, is the sort of the archetypal uh, summation of that. Um, and you look at these images in the book and they're just like, mind blowing and beautiful and incredible. On the other hand, it carries with it. Uh, so this, there is a lot of potential there and it's incredibly uh, rich. It really kind of demonstrates what can be done with very little locally. On the other hand, it carries with it a certain sort of um, uh, Luddite, uh, uh, the, the implications or the suggestion of aversion to technology, which is absolutely not what we're interested in. We're absolutely interested in leveraging the potential of technology, um, of using things in smarter ways, of doing, uh, of, of collaborating with machines to uh, make a more, a better, more livable a city, a better, more livable world. Um, so in a way, I'd, we're, we're very hesitant about using that word, but um, there are a lot of things that we believe can be learned from vernacular architecture. Yeah, I suppose if you look at vernacular as being making do with what you've got, then that is a kind of a more useful distinction. My part of North London, for example, the topography is, is completely shaped by the extraction of clay for bricks and gravel for for you know, building railways and things like that. So the whole the whole landscape is, is artificial, but based on the extraction of materials to build the the city of of London. So it's kind of like a in a way it's a weird kind of circularity. It came out of the ground and then was put above ground, but very very nearby. But you were talking um, about the uh, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion. Do you start to see that kind of architecture in a new? Uh, negative light now because it almost celebrates externalities doesn't it? it says look at this amazing piece of marble where's it from we don't care but it's beautiful absolutely i mean i i, I think it's um it's not super helpful to sort of um go back and um critique a to, to make a sort of a retroactive critique of uh the, the the heroes of modernism but i think there are a lot of dangers in the elevation and in, in the sort of veneration of that model um the heroic uh, architecture there's that famous image of um le courbusier's uh, Ville, the model of villeradieux with his hand hovering over the model you just see the hand of the architect completely out of scale like uh, if that was the city then the hand would probably be like 500 meters long and it's this kind of top-down relationship with the landscape that um that was very much the sort of uh, driving the impetus of uh, of 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 uh, modern architecture and and that's something that um we are we think is very is a dangerous model to give to young designers today um, we're not particularly interested in this centralized um, heroic model of the architect. We're more interested in the architect as a, a collaborative figure who is deeply um, embedded within a community and who is really kind of capable of passing all of the, um, the complexity that's related, as you were pointing out in North London, the kind of the trade-offs between um, building things in a certain way and what the consequences of that would, would be. Um, and in, in the book, in fact, there's... Um, a brilliant essay by Elise Turbe looking at the concept of carbon modernity, uh, the idea how, in a way, in um, in the um, uh, history of architecture, in the kind of the, in the in the history of modernity, there is uh, a certain kind of reliance on carbon and a certain relationship with um, carbon that is extremely um, uh, precise and specific. Um, and in that sense, uh, in, it, it is important to kind of question whether that is a viable model given the, what, we know, what we now know. We're not particularly interested in a sort of a retroactive critique of Mies van der Rohe, who has been an incredible inspiration to all of us. At the same time, we're not interested in that sort of um, heroic approach. Yes, because the Barcelona, Barcelona Pavilion is getting on for a, a hundred years old, but most of architecture is still following that, that pattern, isn't it? Still, it's still, um, largely um, modernist in its approach, even if not in its defini definitively in its aesthetic. Well, I think it's a, it's an interesting question because, in a way, modernism is evaluated on compositional in compositional terms, and then uh, through a certain kind of uh, linear relationship with uh, how certain ideas progressed and developed. And architecture tends, in in a, a sort of canonical sense, um, modernity tends to be very referential. It builds on uh, what was done before. Uh, I think that the uh, compositional aspect is um, obviously it has 
implications for how buildings perform and how buildings perform has implications on uh, what how much damage they do to the environment but beyond that and and so we're not kind of particularly interested in that as a starting point which many modernists were uh, but i think that the interesting thing is that now the tide is a little bit turning uh, and i think a lot of the uh, practices especially the younger practices a lot of the the ones also that you publish and a, a lot of the discourse that is circulating in the moment is uh, very attuned to um, a, a philosophy that is um, not particularly formalist. It's not um, it, it, the, 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 the actual production of an image is not necessarily the starting point. And it's something that takes a lot of courage because of course we're aware of, we're visual creatures. So producing an image is something that uh, immediately kind of uh, has, brings great resonance, but, uh, and is likely to kind of bring you much more visibility. But there are, I think that kind of courageous step of actually starting from a completely different uh, starting point as an architect and actually kind of saying, I refuse to produce an image. Um, or even questioning, as I was saying, uh, Charlotte Malte, Malte Abad's uh, project on, um, uh, which is uh, on the moratorium on building. Um, I think these are all very kind of courageous steps that indicate that there maybe there is a, a different attitude emerging, which is not based on the kind of the, the, the pre conditions that um, might have uh, been 100 years ago. And do you have contemporary examples of people who are doing work that would fit into this idea of non extractive architecture? Are there things that people can look up or even visit or, or is it a very much a vision for something we can strive towards um i i think it's absolutely there's, there's tons of things happening um and like i said before we want to be really clear that this isn't um there's no sort of perfect answer um and we're not a kind of some sort of fundamentalist uh, the approach to this is not fundamentalist where we want to sort of um this is good and this is bad um it, it's it, absolutely a spectrum um and what we're interested in is trying like asking this question is it um, is an architecture possible that doesn't produce externalities, is an architecture possible that doesn't produce depletion? Um, and of course, I think to some extent, every building does, every human activity does. Uh, but the point is that um, th there is a certain amount um, that can be absorbed and there's a certain amount that can't. And if we can transcend that level. Um, and, and so in this, um, this particular book, there are a lot of contributions um, that uh, kind of analyze uh, what is already happening out there. Um, for example, a group uh, called um, uh, Who Makes Your Architecture that looks specifically, for example, at the labor practices underpinning um, some of the um, city uh, building going on in the Middle East or some of the major infrastructural projects and looking really at the kind of consequences at a community level. I think simply uh, kind of uh, looking into um, the what, what are the sort of accepted practices now is a, a crucial starting point, and that's very much the um, the premise of this first volume. The second volume will be much more uh, specifically dedicated to uh, looking and mapping uh, what are the practices that are out there that are that can help us to can get a little bit closer to this goal. So, for example, the idea of um, material passports that are that trace um, components of buildings, for example, um, all the way through from production through to a kind of, uh, rather than kind of end of life cycle where things get decommissioned and then uh, responsibly recycled, we think that that's actually not enough. We actually need to look at ways in which those same components, maybe we can facil facilitate their reuse in other buildings, which of course is something that from going back to the kind of idea of compositional uh, formalist architecture, that's a big sacrifice. You want everything to be custom made. But now actually it's becoming accepted that actually maybe we can make a compromise. Maybe we, um, we don't have to kind of dictate specific um, uh, dimensions that are incompatible with everything else, but why not think in modular terms? Uh, so yeah, there's, um, th th that is going to be the work of this year. So um, if you're able to follow us on, um, yeah, all the various channels on Instagram and or come to Venice and uh, look through the uh, uh, the exhibition. You'll see a lot of examples of this taking place within the building. You talked about their like compatibility, and, and this maybe sounds like a maybe slightly pretentious question, but is non-extractive architecture is it compatible with the economic system we all, that dominates our lives? In a way, modernism was a, a product, a very late product of capitalism, right? It was, it was. And then it became, 
it worked in tandem with with capitalism followed the whole explosion of globalization of the, the idea that you want the same thing everywhere in the world but it fundamentally it was a product of capitalism which still dominates our lives is there space for an architecture like this under that massive um, contentious power umbrella that is the the, the capital system um <clears throat> can it what i mean is can this seed grow yeah, into something yeah, yeah. I, I i would i would answer that i, I would just, i'll be provocatively blunt um, and i would say that in its current form the answer is no it can't fit in the the current definition of capitalism um and that needs to be revisited and i think the fact that it needs to be revisited um, the economic system needs to be revisited is kind of patently obvious because any economic system that's based on uh, permanent unlimited growth is completely incompatible with the reality of a closed system like planet Earth. It's just simply not possible. One could go into a debate about whether you know, the kind of economic productivity that um, capitalism is based on a growth in a continuous growth in productivity maybe could take immaterial form. So in that sense, maybe it is conceivable, but in uh, the, 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 the way that it operates today in which there's kind of an exponential increase in our ability, our efficiency in devastating uh, the um, natural environment we inhabit, I, I think it goes without saying that it's not um, compatible. So uh, I think part of this is also rethinking some of the parameters that within which architecture fits. Um, as we know, architecture is an extremely expensive activity. It's something extremely complex and with a very significant economic footprint. Uh, so it has to fit somehow within the larger uh, framework of the economic system. But in that sense, maybe we need to revisit the economic system to think about what are the metrics of, um, for example, uh, productivity or um, what, what do we consider to be uh, 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 the, the, the measure of our wealth. So, for example, metrics like GDP are perhaps not um, useful, which um, is uh, something that um, I think has been discussed quite a bit um, recently also. Um, uh, Phineas Harper and Maria um, in the uh, uh, Oslo Triennale were looking at the idea of degrowth and questioning the, the, the idea of GDP as a useful metric for uh, measuring prosperity, for example. Um, so I think th these are definitely questions. That's why we're interested in economics. Economics is not something that happened somewhere else. Unless we look at um, economics and we look at uh, philosophy and we look at the kind of broader cultural framework within architecture, within which architecture is born, we're basically going to go nowhere. We're just going to hit the brick wall of just making our buildings more efficient, and that's nowhere near enough. And you mentioned degrowth um, as, a, as a concept there, and then there's also um, the idea of circular design and reversible design, and then there's um, carbon neutrality and carbon negativity or positivity, which sort of are the same, saying the same thing, but in very different ways. There's a lot of jargon out there, and you're adding to the pile of jargon the notion of um, extraction and depletion, which actually maybe not quite the same thing like depletion means that there's less of it to go around but extraction to me means that you you take it and put it somewhere else do, do all of these ideas do they all are they all related to each other do they all talk to each other could could there be one meta movement that comes out of all this because it it, it does get confusing you architects want to do the right thing we all want to do the right thing but which of these which of these um <laughs> which of these trucks do we jump on <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you have a point. Um, is it interest? Is it useful to keep sort of? Uh, uh, it, you, you could describe it as a form of uh, pollution. We're just getting kind of a terminology pollution. I think that's true, but I think also the subject is a nuanced subject. It's something we need to treat, treat with nuance. It's not it doesn't lend itself to generalization. So, for example, I think that's part of part of the. The, the goal here is also to bring slightly the meaning back into the um, into the kind of arena we're dealing with that was completely robbed from sustainability, for example. Sustainability has basically become a completely useless word um, and, um, and not to mention sort of uh, echo, anything with echo after it is, is, is basically just a waste of time because it just has been robbed of all meaning. So I think that we we have to also, um, it's, it's a complex matter and it's not one that we can kind of reduce to a single badge. Um, and 
And also, I think, like I said at the beginning, I, th I think it's important to not be prescriptive or dogmatic about these things. We can't, we are responsible for what we do ourselves. We can't be kind of dictating what everybody else has to do as well. We can make suggestions. So what we're trying to do here is to offer um, a series of, or to kind of at least be systematic in looking at who's doing interesting work around that. And then if you wanna, if, if that's helpful to you, great. If it's not, um, that's that's your choice. We don't want to ob oblige anybody to do anything in particular. Joseph, I'm gonna to have to move on to audience questions now because I could carry on chatting to you about this for all day, but we have um, three questions from the audience. Sana Sarina asks, is non-extractive architecture essentially sustainable architecture? You've kind of, <laughs> you kind of <laughs> just touched on this. If so, what are some of the major changes within the built environments that non-extractive architecture seeks to make? Uh, I think the um, it it you it, it definitely falls under the umbrella of what uh, many would consider sustainable architecture. I think sustainable is the broadest umbrella of all. Um, we specifically are interested in the idea of um, an architecture. Of what are the sort of practical things? I think this idea of perhaps shortening supply chains and having less sort of international trade related to the uh, less international sourcing of materials. Uh, less international support sourcing of labor related to architecture is a great starting point. So it's something very kind of practical that we can do um, and that will also lead to maybe kind of, uh, again, sort of borrowing from the idea of vernacular architecture it can also be more climatically responsive. We don't want just the same kind of um, uh, cookie cutter modernism uh, powered by HVAC systems being replicated all across the world. We want them to also resonate a little bit with the specific uh, conditions that they're in. So that I think is one maybe good example. I should be going back to what we were talking about before about the cookie cutter of capitalism, like all systems, all countries now pretty much following the same rules that, you know, the, 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 the falling apart of the global order and which has then been accelerated by the pandemic means that maybe there are the conditions for things to become more, localized so there is a kind of geopolitical Absolutely. change underway that that all of these these terms could latch onto and we internally at disease we've had the same conversation about sustainability for a while it was a word that we banned because it was meaningless but actually when you come to think about all these different facets of it the only word that kind of you can use to to put them all under is sustainability or green, but that feels even more wishy. -washy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the problem. I mean, language is um, is is important, and I think it's also about reclaiming these words and giving them precise, specific meaning that isn't um, hostage to marketing campaigns. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elsa asks, you mentioned that you're researching architects working with earth as a material. Who are they? What sort of potential do you see in that area? Yeah, we're um, uh, uh, we're super interested in um, very kind of basic abundant materials for obvious reasons, um, and especially when kind of te technology can be the um, factor that makes it a sort of it's where it, where it, where it doesn't become kind of a sacrifice to be working um, with quite uh, abundant, widely available materials, but they can start to perform in a way that we didn't expect. Um, so actually, um, and this is also true, I must say, beside the research that um, is uh, happening within uh, uh, the, the non-extractive architecture platform in Venice, it's also true of our uh, practice of space caviar, where we do, um, a num we're working on a number of projects ranging from um, exhibition design to uh, buildings um, of various scales that, in which we're trying to also kind of put some of these uh, techniques into practice. And um, a lot of the, I would say the most interesting work right now being done around um, alternative uses of earth is happening at uh, IAC. Um, IAAC, uh, which is a school of architecture in uh, Barcelona, uh, that's very much driven by um, research into uh, experimental techniques of production. So they, they're really working a lot on also uh, elaborating formulas for, because of, uh, working with earth has all sorts of problems. It, uh, there are um, issues related to contractions it dries, there's an issues related to its durability um, outdoors, uh, to its structural performance. Uh, and so they're really kind of researching, doing a lot of the research into um, what are the kind of compositional elements that make it perform like an actual building architecture, an architectural material, but with 
the freedom of expression that 3D printing bring, brings. So um, just to, a lot of this will be uh, also kind of um, documented in the uh, volume two uh, and will be also taking place in the form of experiments in um, uh, Venice. But uh, yeah, Yak is a great place to start to look up some of these um, experiments. And final question from Kiev or Kievi. What can we learn from past architectural revolutions that we can use to kickstart a non-destructive architecture in the present? I think that, that's a great question. Um, the one thing that I'm, I think I'm really interested in the um, beyond architecture itself is how certain um, yeah, certain, uh, certain forms of practice or certain forms of artistic production or technical um, processes have a tendency to sort of repropose themselves even hundreds of years apart from each other. And um, I think one of the kind of a, a great example of that is how um, tapestries used to be uh, a really kind of, uh, only a king could afford a tapestry due to the extraordinary amounts of labor that um, actually went into uh, producing it. But it was an amazing way of uh, making a space kind of telling an amazing uh, storytelling tool in terms of um, bringing uh, 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 bringing images the one when there, when there weren't that many ways of doing it and of course now with um, uh, digital uh, weaving and looms it's possible to uh, that's actually something that's kind of becoming one of the most economical ways of uh, actually kind of producing um, durable uh, patterns in uh, materials because they can be actually kind of incredibly um, simply um, weaved. So there's a certain kind of certain techniques that are um, interesting and or, or useful in a specific moment and then disappear maybe even for hundreds of years and then uh, return. And I think that architecture is kind of going through uh, something like that uh, right now where we're rediscovering a lot of the value of um, being once we start to think about the importance of using materials that are abundant, materials that don't cause a lot of uh, 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 negative consequences to um, in, in their production, things like um, uh, everything from uh, seaweed to um, corn to, um, as you know, there's a lot of work going on in uh, Atelier Luma, for example, in the south of France that's looking at uh, seaweed as um, a material, the algae lab uh, for 3D printing as a substitute for plastic. So some of the most advanced polymers, uh, when, when plastic was invented, it was almost this, this moment of uh, kind of um, uh, uh, epiphany that this was the material that was going to solve all of humanity's problems. And now, of course, we realize plastic is probably the, one of the greatest single sources of humanity's problems. So we're going back to seaweed, which is what was uh, being used hundreds of years before. So there's a certain circularity. And I think this is the challenge for um, uh, architecture in general is also to kind of look at how things like rammed earth, uh, which is an incredibly ancient technique um, that was kind of put aside because it didn't make a lot of sense when concrete uh, became available. Now that we know that concrete maybe isn't the answer to all of um, humanity's problems, rammed earth actually kind of becomes interesting again. So how can we uh, make that into something that is um, compatible with our own vision of how we want to live now and there's not simply something retrograde? Uh, talking about concrete, I mean, the Romans had a form of concrete, which a lot of it is still there, isn't it? It's like Absolutely. <laughs> 2000 yeah. years and, and counting. And, and speaking of which, uh, finally, in your book, it starts off with a, a foreword that, that you wrote and you talk about this incredible landscape in, in Italy, which was, which was as they discovered, actually created by the Romans. Tell that story of that the iron ore <laughs> deposits in um, wherever it was. It's the such Baratti, a nice story. Baratti. It's. Um, I, I think one of the things that we wanted to be really clear about this book is that we are not advocating some sort of return to the past. That the past is good, the present is bad, um, and so therefore we just need to. Um, uh, somehow rewind. Um, it was looking more, at, 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 I, th I thought it was important to start from an example that was 2000 years old of how humans had modified the landscape in the service of advancing their goals um, through a, a means that was extractive. Um, and so there's this incredible place in um, on the uh, western coast of Italy, about half in Tuscany, um, uh, a little bit kind of north of um, north of Rome, um, that is uh, it's a small gulf, and it's opposite the island of Elba, more or less. Elba is very rich in 
um, in iron ore. Um, and the Romans obviously had a desperate need, or um, the Etruscans even a little bit before them, had a desperate need for iron in order to supply their military with swords, with weapons. And so they really industrialized the extraction of, um, uh, of iron ore, uh, and they obviously had a very competent navy, navy um, uh, that was capable of shipping very significant amounts of ore back to the mainland. Uh, and on the mainland, in Barati, they built essentially this uh, massive smelting um, apparatus, a, a huge, uh, an industrial village with hundreds of, um, of um, smelting um, uh, facilities where they could extract the um, ore from this, uh, uh, from this, from the rock. Uh, and then they would kind of, and so as they brought more and brought more and they smelted it and it kind of all piled up um, against the coast and they en ended up completely modifying the landscape. And the fascinating thing is that after the decline, the fall of the Roman empire, all of that was kind of um, forgotten. And these hills literally became part of the landscape. It was just, you know, some hills on the coastline near Barapti. And it was only in the, um, set at the beginning of the uh, second of the First World War, when there was um, a desperate need for um, iron in order to build tanks and so on, that they realized that there was, that it happened, it so happened that uh, an archeologist at that particular moment discovered the, what, the, what these hills was made, were made of. And he, um, he started to excavate. So all of these kind of incredible Roman artifacts and Etruscan artifacts started to come out. But in parallel to that, because there was this desperate need for ore, they realized that because the Romans were so inefficient at um, smelting, they were only actually taking about 20% of the, um, uh, the iron that was inside the rock. So they actually started to uh, re, uh, re-smelt all of the Roman rock. So the Romans were actually the source of a lot of the iron that went into the manufacturing of Italian tanks during the First World War. Um, and of course, that, the consequence of that is those hills are no longer there. So I guess what, what, what I was kind of really interested in is this um, relationship with the landscape in which things kind of have play different roles at different moments and, um, and, and everything is a lot more complex than simply just don't take things from underground. It's also about kind of, uh, and also that the past is good and the present is bad. It's, it, it, it's really kind of also trying to attempt to look at the ways in which um, it's kind of part of the human impetus. Uh, it's just that we now, knowing what we, need, we know, we need to plan it a lot more carefully. Yeah, and I suppose it puts a historical um, perspective on the idea of depletion, like one person's depletion is, a, is another generation's asset, potentially. Yeah. Um, but let's not make that feel, us feel so too complacent that we can just carry on rearranging things as, as we see fit. So just thanks so much. It's been great talking to you. Good luck with the project. And we'll be checking in a couple more times during the course of the project as part of our collaboration with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marcus.